Welcome to this panel discussion on corporate finance. We're going to be focusing on investment appraisal. My name is Trevor McElroy. I'm a qualified accountant, but I've spent most of my career as an academic in UK higher education. Can I introduce you to my colleagues this morning? On my left is Paul. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Paul Cummin. Uh, I've been in corporate finance for over 30 years. Uh, I started out with uh, becoming a chartered accountant with Deloitte Touche. Um, I then uh, progressed and I joined a management buyout uh, and stayed in there for uh, about 15 years. Uh, the business grew from a buy-in of three million and exited for just short of 300 million. And we did everything imaginable. Since then, I have focused on advising businesses, uh, and these days I spend a lot of time advising smaller businesses on uh, writing plans and raising funds from angel investors. Thank you. And on my right, can I introduce you to Annalise? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Annalise. I've, uh, I'm a chartered accountant. Um, I have worked for Deloitte uh, and Touche for the last 11 years in three different countries. I've been involved in uh, worldwide uh, audit engagements, um, and a few uh, due diligence projects, um, and I'm currently based in London. The discussion will focus on the Boeing case study, where Boeing made a decision to invest in a new aeroplane which they called the Dreamliner. The investment decision which Boeing was making is of course a very important one for the company because it involves an, a lot of money, uh, a lot of resources, and will commit the company to building this aeroplane for many years to come. So let's start the discussion by looking at some of the aspects which any business has to deal with when they come to making the investment decision. Annalise, perhaps you could start us on this. Well, you know, this is a typical case of uh, dealing with qualifying assets. In other words, uh, assets that take a substantial amount of time before it can actually be used uh, or sold. In this case, it's more use. Um, so, uh, you know, the airline industry is one of these uh, industries, but you've got it also in, in real estate and sometimes in engineering works where, um, you know, computers or machines uh, take one, two to three, four years time in order to get ready. And obviously, uh, you know, the risks are always higher uh, because, you know, technology uh, evolves, um, delays are encountered, which can be very, you know, uh, pricey and can cost a lot of money. So uh, not definitely an easy, you know, an easy environment to make uh, straightforward investment decisions. I don't know, Paul, uh, what's your view on, on investment appraisals? Uh, yeah, I, I, I take a, a, a fairly simple view on it in terms of not just Boeing, but in terms of most businesses that um, it, it should be from the marketplace. In other words, it should be from the ground up. And uh, this as in most businesses, should be done on the basis of research, customer research, mm -hmm. uh, and, and other stakeholders. But um, uh, Boeing have been quite successful in this in terms of their focus groups, which is what led them to decide to move to the um, Dreamliner away from the Sonic Cruiser. And I think that's probably the first and fundamental uh, part of uh, investment appraisal. Then, once you've actually established that um, that demand, as it were, in the marketplace, then obviously you look at the competition. Uh, but it, it eventually has to express itself in a plan. And the plan has, uh, it's not just numbers, it has a profit loss, it has a cash flow, uh, and um, it has some sort of uh, long-term projection mm -hmm. as to what the business will do, which will hopefully serve the objectives that were set out in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now, fundamental within that is, is clearly net present value. I mean, those, mm -hmm. it's a very old style, but it does make a very effective tool still, and there are lots of tools around to enable mm -hmm. you to do that. Um, and, and I think the, um, uh, you know, it is something that is uh, very well written about. And um, how, does a, how does a company like Boeing address, uh, I agree with you, net present value mm. is, a, is, a, is a very robust modelling approach, mm. but how, where does the company identify the cash flows from and, and how can it assess the risk and the discount rate that's required? It, it, you know, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it must be very difficult to actually do this in practice, I think. It, it is. Um, I mean, the, the cash flows um, are, have a huge amount of uncertainty attached to them, uh, not least of which is, you know, the relying on government support, yes. which, which is, a, is a fickle matter at the best yes. of times. Yes. 
the relying on projections of, of customer numbers, uh, and they don't know what the competition are doing. Yes. Uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, is based on, on risk, uh, different risk profiles. In other words, you write about 20 different versions of the plan, and then you try to work out which one is most likely, and probably more likely, they pick the one that chooses where yeah. they think it's going to yeah. go. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but Annalise, maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, no. <laughs> so maybe you've got a more scientific answer to that. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. Net present value is is, is the method that is used, uh, but there are a lot of methods, and and uh, I think the tricky part is always the assumptions, yes. uh, because yes. the assumptions take into account some factors that are unknown. Uh, mm. You know, as you you outline these models, and um, I think. Typically, in the in, in in those type of industries, when it goes wrong, it can go horribly wrong, yes. and, and that is why uh, you know investors. And you mentioned it, Paul, uh, when you talk about government, uh, when you talk about uh, private investors, public investors, uh, mm. it's got a huge implication on yes. on, on the whole yes. uh, on the whole venture again. So, yes. um, but again, I, I would also say that uh, you know discounted cash flow is one way of doing mm. it. There are other ways of, uh, you know, valuing, uh, you know, investment strategies and, and, and coming up with the right answer. But there's so many soft issues, aren't there? I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the environmental issues to do with airlines are yeah. such a huge issue yeah. and, and is very interesting in their decision to move away to a, to a smaller uh, aircraft. The, the, the environmental issues must have come from the focus groups. Yes. Uh, and, and I sense that is becoming a bigger, well, it is becoming a bigger and bigger issue politically as well as economically. Yes. Definitely. Yes. Um, so and that the response to that is, you know, with, with the Dreamliner, it, they're using uh, composite materials. Mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a more efficient plane. It's got a wider range. Uh, so this, is, this is, is a nod towards some of these environmental issues as well, of course. And the, the interesting thing I found was that the, the reason the switching decision from the, uh, to the Dreamliner from the Sonic Cruiser was because the main advantage of, of the, Dream, uh, the Sonic Cruiser was the, um, this gain in speed, whereas in actual fact the, uh, the gain in speed is really uh, can be achieved in lots of other ways on the ground by being efficient, and you don't need to spend hundreds of millions of pounds on an aircraft to yeah. achieve it. Yes, this is the Ryanair and the Boeing yes, it is. where they it turn is really around very quickly on the ground. Yeah, it yes. is. And, yes. and so I, I don't think the demand, the customers will yeah. pay for the speed. Yes. So I, th I think the efficient, slightly slower plane is yes. probably the right, the right way to go. Yes. And also when you think about it, these days you actually want to get to your end destination the quickest without uh, having to transfer through various yes. uh, airports. So I think uh, the Dreamliner also would, uh, you know, is able to land on shorter uh, mm -hmm. landing strips um, as well. So which is also, it, it, you know, beneficial to the timing aspect you mentioned yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, you know, it makes traveling easier. Yeah. yeah, there are clearly a lot of issues to, you know, to any investment decision. But I think we've already seen that for a company like Boeing, it, it's a critical decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, there's a, a lot of money involved, billions of dollars uh, mm -hmm. of development cost, and whatever they decide to build, they're, they're kind of stuck with for the next 20 years, 30 years, who yes. knows? Uh, so it, it's a huge decision that the, uh, the, the Boeing has to make, but it's also a decision that they've got to make. There, there's no option to just stand still and let other manufacturers uh, overtake them in terms of what they yeah, build. Or competitors, I yes. mean, so we were talking about the you know earlier about the airships yes. mm -hmm. and the fact that new new types of competitors are coming in all the time yes. so time is actually against them yes. for sure yes yes okay so let's look at uh, some of the options which uh, which Boeing have got then uh, as at the moment uh, now that they've uh, started uh, building and developing the Dreamliner clearly one option is is to carry on with this and, and to stick with this initial decision do you think that's, uh, w w that is an appropriate uh, strategy for them now, Annalise? Well, personally, uh, I think so, yes. Um, for the sim well, the reasons already mentioned, actually. Um, first, it will get you to places, uh, to more remote or regional places mm -hmm. quicker. And certainly in, in, in <coughs> many countries, certainly such as the UK, regional air airports are, are growing up and, and expanding to take this kind of approach. Absolutely, and, and the environmental uh, issue also is kind of uh, you know achieved mm. in a way because y you uh, it, it's much more efficient in fuel consumption. Yes. Um, so in many ways, I think that this is this is the way to go. I mean, it's it, the technology is there, um, and uh, yeah. So I think the Dreamliner is, is definitely uh, yes. Yeah. What what are perhaps the problems 
that you could foresee with if they carried on with this? Is it, is it, are there any downsides to them continuing? Well, there to are. Be? I mean, there's this huge uncertainty is the problem. There's an uncertainty in political will, yeah. first of all, because we don't know. I mean, these both, all the big uh, manufacturers of airlines, you know, are reliant on government support. They don't know. So I would say that, you know, it's, it's a very difficult business. If I was running this business, yeah. it's very difficult to act with, yeah. with long-term certainty. Short-term, you can. But even in terms of one of the problems with the Dreamliner is it, it's incorporating a lot of new technologies, such mm. as composite materials. Mm. Inevitably, <coughs> that's going to take more time to get mm. right. Mm. It's going to be more expensive. And, of course, you're dealing with a product here that has to be 100% right yes. before it goes to the market. Uh, so, you know, and Boeing still haven't got over that problem. It, it, it's already two years uh, delayed, and uh, this is costing them money. But the mo it's very interesting to see when you look at the projections of traffic on the airlines. I mean, there's these astronomical, huge increase forecasts. So, the, the, I mean, there could be a case put forward for the, uh, the Sonic Cruiser, mm. which is, you know, bigger, and actually for bigger numbers of people, uh, you could have a case where actually that could be very efficient, particularly on longer journeys. So I think, you know, you, you, there's certainly, in my view, there's a, there's a place in the market for, for different types of aircraft. Yes. Um, but the market research, the focus groups, seem to be very lukewarm yes. on the Sonic Cruise. That's and indeed, correct. you know, we, we've seen the demise of Concorde, which, mm -hmm. again, the primary asset of Concorde was yes. speed, and passengers was just weren't willing to pay for, yes, the, for the extra cost. I think for me, I think the, the key will be to be flexible and, yes. and, and a plane that can be used for business mm -hmm. and for leisure mm -hmm. that can be used on long and short distances, on long landing strips and short ones. I think that is where I think an airline um, will probably be benefiting from it, you know, longer term. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I agree with you, like the bigger airplanes for long, long uh, trips uh, are, have definitely their advantages. But... Um, but, but I wonder how much say Boeing will have at the end of the day. <coughs> I think the, the limits on government spending at the moment will be the key driver, in my view, because I think they will want to limit the spend on this, and that will push decision towards a lower-cost airline. In my, that will yeah. be one of the key push to drivers, mm. I believe. So let's, let's move on to perhaps their last option. We're talking about Boeing developing the, these new aeroplanes, but what about how, how do they, you know, should they meet the challenge of the, the Airbus, this big super jumbo? Uh, should Boeing actually meet that channel challenge head on and, and build their own either new super jumbo or adapt the 747? Well, I come back to the, where I started, which was that what is the market demand? Mm -hmm. You know, if the demand is there, then that's possibly something they should pursue. If it's not, and I don't think it is, because I think Annalise is right that the demand is for, you know, more shorter hop journeys, mm -hmm. that will be the determining factor. Mm -hmm. And certainly Boeing's whole philosophy here is, 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 is the one that Annalise has identified, that you know, they're, they're looking for this more flexible, they regard the old hub-and-spoke mm -hmm. approach of massive big airports and people flying off it as, as being out of date now, uh, and flexibility is going to be the key. I think one of the problems also is that uh, in meeting the A380 for Boeing is that the 747 is an old aeroplane mm. now. It's 40 years old in development. Mm. So actually it would still, it would need a lot of extra spend if they were going to build a, a new jumbo. Okay, but well, how do we feel then? That those th perhaps three options, continue with the Dreamliner, revive the Sonic Cruiser or, or emphasize uh, super jumbos. Well, I have to stick with my first answer, okay. <laughs> which is a Dreamliner. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, my, my answer is the same for, diff yeah. for coming out of a slightly different angle. You know, the market says it wants the Dreamliner. Yes. We, sh we should go for the Dreamliner. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, and I, I tend to agree, but clearly there has been a cost of Boeing on this in mm. terms of developing this new aeroplane. It, it, the delays are significant. And the delays are significant not because of the cost overruns and the lack of income, but because, of course, you risk losing customers. Mm. Because mm. Airbus mm. will immediately come in and try and take some of those orders away from them. Uh, so uh, Boeing have not yet uh, solved this one completely, and uh, until they've actually got the new Dreamliner out there on the market, I think there'll, there'll be some anxieties for the company.